So I'm pleased to introduce Craig Richardson, who is the director of the Center for the Study of Economic Mobility at Winston-Salem State University, and Tracy Maguze, an officer in home financing for the Pew Charitable Trusts. Craig and Tracy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Yeah, um, so thank you, Yulia, for this um, opportunity to talk about some of the things that we are seeing at Pew in the uh, small mortgage market. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time out and being here with us today. Um, as Yulia mentioned, I'm Tracy Maguze, and I'm a research officer at Pew. Um, in 2020, we launched our home financing project where we're studying the dearth of small mortgages uh, relative to the availability of low cost site built and manufactured homes and the non-mortgage alternative arrangements that Americans use to purchase homes um, when mortgages are not accessible. Now, um, as you know, a mortgage is the primary pathway to purchasing homes for many Americans because few buyers really have the funds to purchase a home using cash. However, as Julia stated, many credit worthy first time buyers and low to moderate income families are failing to access the financial benefits of home ownership because of a lack of small mortgages, um, even in those communities which have a significant stock of low, low cost homes uh, priced at $200,000 um, and below. Um, others, including uh, Ben Eisen, who's on our panel today, have noted this decline in the number of small mortgage uh, mortgages that lenders have been originating over the last 20 years. Now, for instance, between 2009 and 2015, small mortgage production nationally decreased by 38%. In contrast, uh, there was a 65% increase in origination of mortgages above 150,000. And this is even after controlling for things like rising home prices. So the number of small mortgages being used to purchase homes is disproportionately lower than the number of low cost homes that are being sold. Um, an obvious problem with the lack of small mortgages is that it hinders affordable home ownership and wealth building opportunities for many low to moderate income uh, families who are the ones who are most likely to use these mortgages. Uh, an additional problem that we've noted at Pew is that some of those home buyers who cannot get a mortgage often end up turning to alternative financing arrangements um, like your lease purchase agreements, land contracts, seller financed mortgages, and uh, personal property or chattel loans, as some call them. Now, uh, while some have successfully converted to home ownership using these arrangements, many others have not been so lucky. You see, these arrangements often cost more and have fewer protections than mortgages, and they can strip wealth from families and communities. Uh, pending Pew research actually shows that millions of families have used something other than a mortgage to finance the purchase of their homes, with uh, uh, Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous homeowners more likely than others to use these uh, alternative arrangements that I mentioned. So like our colleagues at New America, at Pew, we're also trying to understand the challenges lenders and borrowers face in the small mortgage market um, only at the national level. Um, for our national analysis, we've paid small mortgages at $150,000 and below. This is based on in-depth interviews with lenders in different regions um, and observed decline in loans at this point in the administrative data and the usage of non-mortgage alternative financing that's well above $150,000. Uh, through our research, we've identified a number of issues that impact the supply of small mortgages. These issues basically fall into two buckets. They are either structural or regulatory, but when combined, they affect the incentives to originate more small mortgages. So of the structural issues, um, the top three highlighted in our work and echoed by those we've spoken to are origi fixed origination costs, um, loan officer compensation, and the habitability of uh, low priced properties. The cost of originating especially has been a recurring theme in our research. 
um, the fixed costs to originate a small mortgage are in some cases similar to, or only slightly less than the costs to originate uh, a higher balance mortgage. Some of the big ticket items in highlighted include um, people, technology, compliance, and appraisal fees. Origination costs are significantly higher as a share of the loan amount for small mortgages. So it becomes economically challenging for both the lender and the borrower. Um, as I mentioned, loan office compensation is another issue that's often cited. A cap on compensation combined with commission-based remuneration makes it more viable to focus on higher balance loans. But um, even if lenders could overcome challenges with costs and compensation, they're also having to contend with an aging inventory of low priced homes um, in need of repairs. So while the Urban Institute's research has shown that there's a stock of low priced properties, the available inventory is often aging and dilapidated and home repair programs are just struggling to keep up with the demand. Um, on the other hand are the regulatory barriers. And we found these to be a little more complex. So on one hand, um, existing mortgage rules have been cited as sometimes feeding some of the structural issues. However, I think we'll all agree there's still an important component of managing risk and ensuring consumer safety. The real issue it appears here is um, the need to balance both interests in a way that promotes uh, small mortgage production. Um, so over the course of our project at Pew, we'll explore each of these issues to better identify which ones restrict small mortgage lending and to what extent, so that uh, policymakers have the information that they need when they're examining the challenges to borrowers and lenders in the market and in crafting solutions at the national level. We already see opportunities um, to streamline regulations and business practices to improve small mortgage production by, lend by lenders uh, while continuing to ensure proper consumer protections. Um, some of these changes have already been introduced, such as Fannie Mae's decision to include a positive rent payment history in its risk assessment, and um, FHFA's decision to expand the use of uh, desktop appraisals, both of which may expand credit access and reduce the overall cost of originating uh, small loans. Um, in summary, I'd just like to say that uh, the issues I've highlighted paint just part of the picture, which is made up of different experiences across the country. And of course, today we're going to hear more about the Winston-Salem small mortgage market and um, how it's affecting borrowers and lenders. So again, uh, to the folks at New America, thank you again for having me and I'm um, looking forward to hearing more on your findings. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy, for giving that nationwide sweep of this problem. And thank you, Yulia. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for us to work with New America as a research team uh, together, such a group of talented individuals. And it's taken months and months and months to uh, conduct this research with interviews with county officials, real estate lenders, other experts. And we, we certainly have a long list of people we thank in our report. Well, first of all, why Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, first of all? Well, for those of you who are tuning in today um, who don't live here, our Center for the Study of Economic Mobility was established at Winston-Salem State four years ago to study a perplexing problem, which is why is the country's uh, one of the most desirable medium-sized cities, Winston-Salem, according to US News and World Report, also near the bottom in terms of economic mobility, according to a landmark study by Roz Chetty. East Winston, particularly uh, the Black and Hispanic side of East Winston, has a huge disparity in income, wealth, and economic mobility. And you can see, um, if we can see the slide that comes up, um, how where we are with uh, in terms of the state and with East Winston. We are located, uh, Winston-Salem State, on the east side of 52, and East Winston is going to be the area that we talk about today. So. In four years, we've learned a lot, including that Winston-Salem and Forsyth County are not unique. In fact, there's an enormous swath of towns and cities that faced issues that have to do with broken rungs on the economic ladder. 
And the ability to climb these rungs is harder than it used to be, particularly at the bottom. Next slide, please. In looking at why Americans are having trouble climbing the economic ladder, we need to look at an important aspect of how wealth is built over the generations. As well as being part of connected neighborhoods, this aspect of home ownership. Now, for those of you living in big cities, the idea of buying a home for less than $100,000 probably seems like a fantasy. But today I pulled up a home from uh, East Winston-Salem selling for $85,000, a little bungalow, two bedroom, one bath, 1,100 square feet. And so as we can see from this map, one in five owner-occupied homes across the United States have a market value under $100,000. The problem is it's getting increasingly hard to finance these homes through a traditional mortgage, as, as Tracy's pointed out with, with uh, their research. And this is really the subject of this report, but what we're doing is a really deep dive into Forsyth County in Winston-Salem to really distill out what's the problem here. And there are also a lot of spillover consequences. Next slide, please. Now, one aspect that we focus on is the change in the relative cost of financing a mortgage and how that has changed in the era after the financial crash and the Great Recession. Now, one part of Dodd-Frank banking regulations was to make sure that closing costs weren't too high for these small mortgages, because we know that there were some predatory lending institutions that wrapped up a lot of hidden fees that contributed to foreclosures. But as we investigated, it seems like the legislation may have gone too far the other way. Because now what we have are caps on points and fees that has a schedule. And that schedule is that green line that we've produced from our report that comes straight from legislation. And as you can see, the line has a lot of odd kinks and slopes. In addition, we put in a hypothetical overhead cost line. This is the internal cost for processing the loan. And as we've spoken with bankers, that those fixed costs are fairly constant. Now, when you have a regulated schedule of what banks can earn, it's pretty easy to see from this figure that there's an area where there's a lot of money to be made, there's an area in the middle where there's a little bit of money to be made, and there's an area where there is no money to be made. And predictably, what we expected to find when looking at this schedule was that we would see an exit from what's the exit from the smallest mortgage areas. And that's how it helped guide our questions to lenders to, in fact, find out is this actually happening or not. Next slide, please. Now, this is a pretty staggering figure of Forsyth County. Remember East Winston, that is the line on the bottom and the rest of Forsyth County is on the top. And you can see what happened through the Great Recession. There was a collapse in property values on both ends, but East Winston suffered a tremendous collapse in value. Um, and the other part of this is that these values have not rebounded. These are real values of housing coming from Zillow, a very reputable statistical source. And what we see is that, I think our logic here is that we're, we, I think we have as a working hypothesis, is that if you have a huge amount of buyers who no longer can get access to mortgages because banks are not offering them, then, the logic would tell us there's going to be a falling demand in this section of the market, which is going to lead to stagnating property markets in our city's poorest areas. All you have left for, for the most part is all cash buyers. They are therefore a small fraction of the entire set of potential buyers. And not only that, the cash buyers who will likely turn those into rental properties or flip them, have almost no incentive to maintain these properties. In our report, we show a change in the uh, decreasing maintenance. So that's a working hypothesis that comes out of the data. And next slide, please. And the result here is, again, stunning and shocking. That for someone who'd in invested $1,000 for every $1,000 in property in East Winston, 
they have lost 57% of their wealth. On the west side, the wealthier side, the whiter side, the medium and upper class side, they have seen an average of 29% increase since 1996. In fact, when we calculated the entire amount, we found that home values in, in some in East Winston fell from 3.4 billion to 1.1 billion, a 66% contraction. This is not what we think of as the American dream. Next slide, please. So this is where our project began, the Small Mortgage Project with New America, our great partners, and our own center. And the project is really about documenting why it became so difficult for lower income families to get access to credit and buy a home. What are all those hurdles to getting a mortgage that did not used to exist? And to talk about this potentially is a link. We think there's a very strong potential for links between growing wealth gaps between whites and blacks and Latino families and the growth of concentrated poverty. Forsyth County and Winston-Salem are just one story across the United States, and we think they're representative of many, many cities. So now I wanna hand it over to Sevilla and Zach, um, who have worked uh, extremely hard as lead authors on this report to get more in depth into the report and talk about how this got became so difficult. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, Normada, if you don't mind just pulling up our slides, um, I can get started though. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sabiha Zainalbai and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Future of Land and Housing Team at New America. Um, I'm one of the lead authors on the report that was released earlier today along with my colleague, Zach, um, and we are going to be sharing some of our findings from the report um, called the lending hole at the bottom of the home ownership market. Um, so Tracy and Craig really did a great job of setting up this issue, uh, both at the national level and also um, contextualizing it in uh, a local housing market of uh, Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, North Carolina. Um, so what Zach and I are going to do is just walk through um, some of our findings specific to uh, Forsyth County and Winston-Salem from the report. Um, so we explored some of the major challenges related to the increasing difficulty for low and moderate income Americans to access home, home ownership. Um, and building upon a lot of the great um, existing research done by Urban and Pew and um, some of the great reporting that's been done on this issue nationwide, um, we largely used Adam data and Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, um, as well as findings from 31 qualitative interviews that we did with real estate agents, lenders, and housing leaders um, to better understand how national trends um, for small dollar loans and small dollar homes um, play out in a local housing market. Um, so just a note, we use $100,000 as a cutoff for both uh, small dollar loans and small dollar homes um, in this report, meaning um, anything we explore lo the loan market below $100,000. Um, and that cutoff is intended to convey a point below which mortgage, lo mortgage loans are becoming increasingly less accessible, but that really varies across the country. Um, and Tracy mentioned before, um, other researchers use other cutoffs as well. Um, so next slide, please. So as Craig discussed, um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina is in many ways a prototypical US city in that it's geographically segregated by race and income, um, divided in large part by US Route 52. Um, and we're particularly interested in East Winston, which is a collection of neighborhoods. Um, you can see it in the left-hand chart um, designated uh, by purple. And um, we're particularly interested in East Winston, um, not just because it's, it's, it's segregated um, from the rest of Winston-Salem, but it also um, has a high concentration of these small dollar homes, homes below $100,000, um, as well as a, um, it's comprised mostly of communities of color. It's 80% Black and Latinx, while the rest of Forsyth County is 31% Black and Latinx. And, um, it also has a much lower home ownership rate and higher poverty rate relative to the rest of Forsyth County. 
Um, and so Craig mentioned that across the country, um, affordable homes, homes under $100,000 do exist. And the same is true in Forsyth County. We see that 30.4% 30 of homes are below $100,000. And like I said, most of these homes are, um, there's a high concentration of these homes specifically in East Winston, which you can see in the map um, that's from the report on the, um, on the right. Next slide, please. So today, Zach and I are gonna discuss three interrelated challenges in accessing home ownership for lower income families in Forsyth County. Um, and those are the de decreasing availability of small dollar loans, um, the catch-22 of mortgage standards or the relatively strict criteria for loan products intended for lower income families um, that further locks many people out of home ownership. And then lastly, the competition with all cash buyers. Um, and across all these challenges, we found that what's happening in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County um, and the housing market there really mirrors what's happening nationwide. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Zach. Thank you. So my name is Zach Blizzard. I'm the research manager at CSIM and one of the authors of the report. So I'm going to begin by establishing some trends related to small dollar loans and how they have become increasingly unavailable over time. Next slide, please. And um, one more slide. Thank you. So small dollar loans have declined substantially relative to their pre-financial crisis levels, and they have not rebounded, unlike for larger loans. So this chart shows the percent difference in originations for mortgage loans, which are just you know, the number of loans extended to applicants, of differing amounts relative to their level in 2007. So by 2019, loan originations for small dollar loans, which are represented by the blue line, were 52.5% below their 2007 level. Loans between 100 and $200,000 are also below their 2007 level, but only by 7.5%. And then originations for loans above $200,000 have completely surpassed their pre-crisis levels. So what this chart basically shows is that lenders are making fewer small dollar loans than they did prior to the financial crisis. This lower level of originations in combination with the fact that denial rates are two to three times higher for small dollar loans compared to larger ones means that it has become harder and harder to purchase homes with a small dollar mortgage loan. So with that, I'll turn it back to my colleague, Sabiha. Next slide, please. Thanks, Zach. So um, uh, finding from our qualitative interviews, we heard time and time again from agents, lenders, and housing experts that one of the biggest barriers facing low-income residents in accessing homeownership was the lack of affordable housing in good condition. Um, so the in good condition part is really important since loans that are intended for lower income borrowers like um, Federal Housing Administration loans or in Forsyth County affordable homeownership programs through um, the state or the county um, have higher criteria on the condition of a, of a home. Um, and without passing this higher criteria, these sort of mortgage standards, um, lenders won't, uh, are not likely to approve of those loans. So for example, FHA loans require um, a home meets minimum property standards for the safety, security, and soundness and local loan products um, through the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency or uh, Forsyth County have uh, rigorous inspection requirements. Um, oh, next slide, please. So this is all, of course, intended to protect, protect buyers from having to make repairs they can't afford, but it has somewhat of a perverse effect. Um, because homes under $100,000 are homes that we would typically consider affordable um, are often older uh, and in need of substantial repair, um, that relatively poor condition of these small dollar homes in combination with these stricter um, standards on the condition of the home um, for some of these uh, uh, more accessible loan products kind of creates this catch-22 in which the buyers who most need financing find it most difficult to access. Um, next slide, please. So uh, you can see in this map also from the report, and one thing I should mention is in the report, all of the, rep all of the um, maps and charts that you see are interactive, so you can actually hover over them and 
um, see the underlying characteristics of a census tract. This is not a census tract map or um, so I encourage you to uh, take a look. But um, this map shows that homes that it, it's, it's showing that where are homes that are assessed to be in poor um, or in fair condition, uh, where they're located without throughout Forsyth County. Um, and you can see here that those that are um, unlikely to pass inspection, so those that are in poor or fair condition are clustered in East Winston. Um, and this, you know, this, I, I have a quote here from um, a real estate agent that we spoke to, and they said, say there's a beautiful house and someone stole the heat pump. That's not going to stop someone with a conventional loan from buying a house, but it would, but it could with an FHA loan. Um, so this is just sort of another instance of criteria designed to protect lower income borrowers, unintentionally preventing them from accessing financing on homes. Um, so I'll turn it back to Zach to talk through uh, cash purchases. Thank you. So we're, we next turn to patterns we observed related to cash purchases of homes. So most Americans need to borrow money to be able to afford a home. So the use of cash can help us understand who is and who is not purchasing homes in a certain price range. Next slide, please. So this chart shows the share of home purchases made in cash versus with a mortgage loan since 2001. So we can see in this chart that there has been a slow and steady increase in the prevalence of cash purchases of homes in Forsyth County, but that trend leveled off and kind of remained stable since 2013. But the primary takeaway is that mortgage loans have always been more prevalent than cash across all home purchases. So today, around 64% of all home transactions involve a mortgage loan and around 36% involve cash. That being said, things look very different when we look only at the market for small dollar homes. So if we can go to the next slide. So today, small dollar homes in Forsyth are three times more likely to be purchased with cash than a mortgage. So as you can see in this chart, there has been a steep and steady increase in the prevalence of cash among small dollar purchases since at least 2001 when the percentage of small dollar homes purchased with cash was just around 25%. So in the report, we actually look at the geographic distribution of cash purchases across Forsyth County. And we see that there is a higher concentration of cash purchases for small dollar homes in East Winston, but in general, they're fairly prevalent across the county. So cash purchasers, which they tend to be investors, they seem to be filling the gap by the absence of potential buyers with small dollar mortgages. And additionally, you know, cash purchases are out competing those buyers that happen to have a small dollar mortgage loan simply because cash is a lot more attractive to a seller. So I'll turn things back to Sabina. Next slide. Yeah, so what does this all amount to? Um, so over the last decade and a half, we see a steady downward trend in small dollar lending, um, consistently higher denial rates for small loans compared to large ones, and an increasing prevalence of ca cash purchases on these homes. Um, and essentially, the reason that we, um, we studied this in the first place is because it's the effect is it's squeezing low and moderate income buyers out of the market altogether, even those with good credit and money for a down payment. Um, and Forsyth County in Winston-Salem has relatively robust home ownership programs that um, lower income residents can take advantage of. Um, and so essentially what we see is would, a, a lot of would-be first-time homeowners um, are unable to get affordable homes and because of that unable to start building wealth. Um, and instead, as Zach just pointed out, we see cash buyers snapping up these relatively affordable homes and turning them um, either flipping them and selling them for a profit or um, turning them into rentals. Uh, so we hypothesize that on an individual level, this um, is contributing to the widening of the racial homeownership gap um, and leading people, as, Trace, as Tracy talked about, to turning them to riskier alternatives like um, contract for deed arrangements and the like. Um, and we also think at the neighborhood level, something we want to explore a little bit more, um, that this is contributing to a downward spiral of disinvestment and stagnation. Um, so in short, homeownership for lower income Americans is becoming extremely difficult to access and it's not getting any easier. Um, 
And there are, uh, you know, expanding access to reasonably priced small dollar mortgages uh, would help many households in communities with lower than average home ownership rates, um, similar to those that we see in East Winston. Um, so we really encourage everyone to check out the report. It's on New America's website. Um, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Um, the next slide has Zach's in my email. And then we also have a Q&A at the end of this event um, where people can um, offer their questions um, for us to respond to. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Malcolm to start our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sabiha, and thank you all for joining today. Um, my name is Malcolm Glenn, and I'm a fellow with the Future of Land and Housing Program here at New America, and I'm also the Director of Public Affairs at Better.com, which is a digital home ownership platform that helps people identify, buy, and insure their homes. And this challenge is something that we've certainly grappled with um, at Better as well. I'm really excited to dig deeper today into some of the findings of my colleague's report uh, which you just heard about, and hear from a bunch of people with real expertise on this topic. And I'm going to spend the next portion of our event today uh, moderating what I suspect will be a really wonderful conversation with some really, really great insights from experts on this topic of small dollar mortgages. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce each panelist, and then I'll give them all a chance to go into more detail about their backgrounds and their areas of expertise. So without further ado, joining me for the panel today is Lena Zhu, who is a research associate with the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute. We have Jada McLean, who is the co-founder of Hurry Home, which is a platform focused on solving the very problem that we're talking about today. We also have Ben Eisen, who is a banking and finance reporter with the Wall Street Journal. And last but not least, we're joined by Neil Parnell, who is the Chief Sales Officer at Piedmont Federal Savings Bank. Welcome to all of our guests. And before we jump in, I will just remind the audience, as Sabiha just said, that um, we have a Q&A that we will be getting to in the last 15 or so minutes of our time today. So please do submit your questions around any of the folks um, who you've heard from today. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. So we really wanna hear from you all as well. So to jump into the panel discussion, um, maybe we can start and just go around and hear from each of our panelists to talk a bit about your specific orientation to small dollar mortgages, including the context that you've come to understand the issue. So um, maybe we can start with Jada and then we can go around and hear from everyone else. So Jada, feel free to kick us off. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. So I'm Jana McLean. I am the CEO and co-founder of Hurry Home, which uh, is a startup that aimed to provide a friendly rent to own for small dollar mortgages in South Bend, Indiana. So we started off really looking at what was out there, um, like, you know, land contracts and some of the other type of really predatory um, mechanisms, and then looked at the lack of small dollar mortgages and tried to find something that sat within all of those that could serve um, these homeowners. Wonderful, thank you, Jada. Uh, thank you for all the work that you've done in this space. Ben, perhaps we can go to you next. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, great to be here, thanks for having me. I am uh, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I focus on banking and write a lot about the large financial institutions, but also focus on the ways that consumers and individuals interact with the banking system and where they're excluded. So um, I kind of stumbled upon this issue of, of lack of small dollar lending, um, you know, I, actually after seeing some data on it from the Urban Institute. So um, glad that Lena's here. And, um, I, you know, it really raised the question for me of, um, you know, isn't it strange that you kind of have this, this entire portion of the housing market where the obstacle to home ownership really isn't the, the the price of the home itself. It's the it's the lending market, and um, that kind of piqued my interest. So I've been exploring this from a couple of different angles over the last few years. Wonderful, thanks, Ben. And I love that your introduction to this space came in part because of research from folks like Lena. So with that in mind, Lena, perhaps you can introduce yourself next. 
Thank you, Malcolm. Um, good afternoon and good morning to those who are in the West Coast. Uh, I'm a research associate with the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute. I conduct data-driven uh, quantitative research on policy issues related to the mortgage finance, housing policy, and racial inequality. Thanks so much for having me today. And big shout out to New America and the Western Salem State University for putting out this important report on small dollar loans. Really inspiring findings. Um, I always appreciate the opportunity like today to discuss issues around small dollar loans and this space is full of challenges as comprehensively summarized by this report. And motivated by those challenges in 2019, Urban Institute together with FAHI and Homeownership Council of America launched a micro mortgage demonstration project in Louisville metropolitan area, aiming at making small dollar mortgages more feasible and accessible, especially to LMI my home buyers. We experimented with different approaches and learned many important lessons on small dollar loans. So really looking forward in today's discussion to exchange those thoughts and learn more about challenges and solutions at both national and regional levels. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. And thank you for being here. Uh, Neil, you're up next. Thank you, Malcolm. My name is Neil Parnell. I'm the Chief Sales Officer with Piedmont Federal Savings Bank here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, been either a mortgage loan officer, uh, retail mortgage loan officer, or in this role for going on around 10 years. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Um, this is something we try to keep our, our ear to the ground on um, quite a bit to, to continually adjust our products, to try to, um, to focus on being able to help um, LMI borrowers. So thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you all for those introductions. I think you all bring a real wealth of expertise to this issue. And uh, I, I suspect that you've all probably drawn upon your respective areas of expertise in your own journeys um, exploring this issue. Um, so I wanna kick us off maybe talking a little bit about some of um, Ben's reporting actually on this issue. Uh, I've read some of your pieces, Ben, and you describe how the American financial machine works pretty well for high earning Americans with pretty traditional finances, but perhaps not as well for borrowers on the margin. So I'm hoping that maybe we can broaden the scope of, of that idea a little bit and talk about how this issue fits within the larger context of access to home ownership and wealth building and how it might be impacting neighborhoods in cities and counties across the country. So Ben, maybe we can start with you and then we can hear from Lena as well on that question. Sure, thanks Malcolm. Um, I, you know, one of the things I've found in reporting on these issues of just access to credit generally is uh, just the more you look, the more holes there are in this in this system that otherwise works very well for affluent people and people with traditional finances. Um, you know, recently have done some stories on um, access to credit on American Indian reservations and um, also in the manufactured housing market, um, but focusing specifically on uh, small dollar loans, this is a particularly important kind of hole in, in financing because it really cuts off uh, an entire price range of people to, to affordable housing. And a lot of people who might access mortgages in this part of the market are people who would benefit from home ownership the most and benefit from kind of the wealth building characteristics that come with home ownership uh, uh, typically. So this is, this is an issue we've spent a decent amount of time looking at. And um, one of the things I found in my reporting is, is that when you do have this kind of lack of access to small dollar lending, it's not just an impact on the individual that's locked out, locked out of home ownership. It really can kind of take a toll, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on an entire neighborhood. Um, and I've looked at this specifically in Detroit, um, which is a city that has a lot of affordable homes. Um, a lot of homes that are priced under fifty thousand dollars. These are houses that often need a lot of a lot of work. You know, uh, might need a new roof, might need might need a new foundation, all of these things. Um, but because there's no way to kind of finance the repairs, finance the purchase, um, a lot of the, the neighborhoods where these homes exist really kind of sit stagnant. And um, when you look at the city itself, the the city in in some parts is really staging a rebound. You have um, neighborhoods that are kind of uh, uh, have property values that are rising really quickly. And then at the same time, you have neighborhoods where 
uh, they really aren't. And you can kind of walk one, one block from uh, one neighborhood to another or, you know, just a few blocks and you end up uh, going from one place to another. And so the dividing line between these mortgages is, is really kind of a key effect that um, can kind of hold back some of these neighborhoods. And um, in Detroit specifically, what we found is it often divides along racial lines. Detroit's a very historically black city and um, it's now becoming a bit whiter, but um, you, you end up having the homeownership rates uh, for white people in the city uh, dramatically are, are, are they, they own a much larger concentration of the homes uh, in the city than, than people of color. And that, that is sort of one of the kind of lingering issues that, that, that you see as a result of that. Thank you, Ben. And I love how you connected not just the broader financial system to this challenge around people getting access to ownership, um, but you also really talked about the racial component and how, whether intentional or not, there are real implications along racial lines for um, this issue as well. Before we hear from Lena, I just want to say to all of our panelists, I might direct specific questions to one or, or two of you, but you should certainly feel free to chime in. Um, even if it's not directed at you, I'm sure you all have a lot to add to um, all of these questions. Lena, maybe we can hear you answer that same question. How does the broader American financial machine really uh, play a role in this limited access to home ownership for so many Americans? Sure. Uh, thank you, Ben, for laying out the context. And this is a really great question. Under the current CRA regulations, banks receive credit if they make loans to LMI neighborhoods or LMI borrowers. But the problem we're facing here is that we not only need an income proxy, but also a risk proxy in the small dollar loan lending space. Our research finds that LMI neighborhoods are not the same as minority neighborhoods, and LMI borrowers are also not the same as minority borrowers. The majority of the demand for small dollar mortgages come from African-American and Hispanic renters. So lack of financing support to minority LMI households for small dollar loans have large implications on widening homeownership gap as well as racial wealth gap at both individual level as well as the neighborhood level. So more specifically at the individual level, access to small dollar loans is not readily available, forcing buyers to turn to cash, land contracts or chattel loans and providing advantages for speculative non-owner occupants. Those low cost homes tend to be concentrated in LMI minority na uh, neighborhoods with more than 60 or 70% of their current residents as minority households who currently earn, earn less than 80% of a AMI. So without access to purchase loans, current minority residents won't be able to buy the property free in cash. This will deprive the homeownership opportunities for African-American, Hispanic, and other minority neighborhoods. Moreover, at the same time, many LMI families pay more for rent than the monthly cost required to own a home. So this situation will leave them continuously rent burdened with limited options for upward mobility and, uh, and homeownership opportunities. And at the same time, at the neighborhood level, long-standing segregation, disinvestment, and redlining have further increased barriers to homeownership in neighborhoods of color that have low-cost housing stock. Neighborhoods concentrated with large number of low-cost homes tend to have very limited resource of allocation measured by economic opportunities and education resources. So without support for LMI renters, they are also at the risk of displacement when their neighborhoods experience influx of investors. This will in turn form a vicious cycle in which LMI minority neighborhoods fail to maintain stability for current residents, and at the same time also fail to provide options for upward mobility and ownership opportunities for local homeowners. So um, I think it's a problem that needs a holistic approach, uh, but the first step is always to raise the awareness for the public. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lena. I really appreciate you speaking to that. Neil, I just saw you come off mute. If you want to add something, please go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Malcolm. And, and I will, I will touch on this a little bit from the, from the lending standpoint, from the, the banking as well. You know, looking at the current economy, there's been so much stimulus money that's been put into the economy over the last 12 to 18 months. One of the, the most recent things that we're seeing is, is you've got you've got consumers out there that have quite a bit of liquidity that they're sitting on right now, and they're looking for a yield. And they can't get those, those yields that they're needing 
sitting in a bank because there's, the interest rates are so low on deposits. So what they're doing is they're taking that money and they're driving up the prices, uh, the asking prices and, and the, what they're, the contract prices of these homes, which is it's outpricing the, the, the small dollar mortgages or small dollar affordable homes, which is taking up that inventory. So we talk about kind of the, the American machine and, and how that works and how it's driving this. This is what's what this continual cycle um, you continue to see, and this is what's making it it's so difficult, is folks are looking for yield, and it's, it's basically the, the market in itself which is making this very difficult um, and causing the, the inventory shortage as well. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, I appreciate that addition. And one of the things that I heard across what all of you said is that despite the fact that there have been um, efforts put in place to sort of exactly mitigate these type of circumstances, you know, all of these different interrelated issues have brought us to the point where we are now. And there's a level of complexity at play that makes uh, solving these problems really challenging. That's something that I've heard from some of the folks who I've talked to who have actually been involved in the process of trying to buy a home and have found it really difficult in part because of that complexity. Um, Jada, maybe we can turn to you with that in mind. Um, you're someone who actually works with potential home buyers uh, and have done so in the past as well. I'm wondering if you can share more about who, from your perspective, is most impacted by this issue and whether there are aspects that we may be missing when we're examining this issue through the sort of high level lens that we always take. So Jada, I'd love to hear from you and then anyone else who'd love to chime in on that question after Jada, we'd love to hear from you too. Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's, and it's so funny that that like you guys ask about the profile of the person because I often describe the profiles person as as the everyday American. Um, so it'd be, you know, people that may have never left their hometown, you know, strong roots in their community, born and raised, and have no intention of leaving. Um, for us, the average income was about forty one thousand dollars was what we were seeing, um, and. I mean, now we can say they're essential workers. You know, they're the bus drivers, they're factory workers, they're CNAs. Um, they're people that are like hardworking people that are working full-time jobs. I mean, sometimes they have their own businesses, they're business owners, they're creating jobs. Um, and so it's like hard to say who's kind of within that group, um, but we know the ones that had been the most successful in our program. And I guess I can go a little deeper on our program. It was, it's a we looked at everything that was out there and we said, what can, what, what can we create that um, aligns the incentives better? Um, so as to not, not uh, you know, get, get uh, as, so as to not um, limit the amount of families that are able to convert to full home ownership. Um, and we came up with a 10 year product um, where we, where it's a friendly rent to buy. Um, and we realized that over a 10 year period, um, the families do so much to care for the house that they should get credit for that. And as, in, as investors view that, um, families also, long-term residents, save them a lot of money on property management, on, on turnover and, and other expenses. So we applied some of that savings back to the family in an earned credit. And then that on top of um, their monthly payments was able to allow them to accrue 100% ownership in the house at the end of a 10 year period. Um, so the families that we have had been really successful with this are again, some of those everyday Americans, but the ones that were totally ready to be, to be a homeowner. And we determined that by, you know, two years of positive rental track record um, and utility track record, and then making sure that their monthly payment is below a 30%, 30% of their gross monthly income. Um, so because we put those thresholds in place, we had families that have even left their houses, you know, within four years and was able to walk away with um, a big lump sum of cash that is, you know, the, the beginning of generational wealth, um, or they could use to, to maybe purchase a, a, a higher value house. Or, and then some people that have actually paid more than they needed to on a month to month basis to then earn the home ownership in their house. Um, so it's, it's definitely not the families living on the edge. It's, it's the families that, you know, have been, been paying their rent and can demonstrate they've been doing that. Um, but with the, and, and if you give them the right structure, which we kind of did with, with the kind of guardrails of, you know, 30, no more than 30% of their income and making sure that they had a demonstrated record, which we actually took that from Urban Institute. Um, there was data on 
if, if a family had more than two years of positive rental payment history, it is likely that they, they will not um, default. And, um, and then they're able to really cash in on some of the city's homeownership programs. And then they're even able to start to build credit because that was definitely one something consistent is our families did not have meet the credit threshold. Their average was really around that like 560, 580. That's really helpful. And I love that you described, you know, um, the, the folks who find themselves in these situations as everyday Americans, because I think that's exactly right. These people are going to work, trying to provide for their families the same profile as everyone else who has this dream of engaging in the homeownership space. Any other folks maybe you want to talk to how they um, envision the profile, or at least in their experience, who they've seen who's really most impacted uh, by these challenges? I'll jump, I'll jump in there, Malcolm. Jared, I wholeheartedly agree with you. This is this is the everyday American. It's also, you know, we, we work with first time home buyers on a day in and day out basis. And, and we're trying to educate folks to make sure exactly what you were saying, Jada, is make sure you put a guardrail in place that you tell, you give them an idea of what their monthly expense will be so that they, one, they can comfortably make that payment and, and two, build that equity um, in that home. One of the biggest things that we see a, a struggle and a, and a challenge is, is making sure in, in this environment, it, it's even more complicated is making sure that we can come up with that down payment. And I will tell you for, for years in the Winston-Salem market, uh, we felt like we had, an, we had a competitive, um, affordable first time home buyer program with a 97% loan to value. And I will tell you, as we kept going, it, it's not competitive um, because you continue to see that struggle with, with saving up that 3%. And we actually just revamped our, our program and our product to go to 100%. And, and the way we did that is we did a 90% loan to value loan and we took down payment assistance, uh, which ends up through the county and, and the city, and, and we utilize as many different markets as we can with that to make sure that we're able to help as many uh, as many customers as we can, especially in that low to moderate income uh, income bracket, because it, it is so difficult to save uh, to save that kind of money. We talk about the current inflation, whether it's it's here to stay or whether it's transitory. This is this is a challenge, and coming up with that down payment is is very, very difficult. So making sure that we utilize these down payment assistance funds is how we're going to help with that and to, and to bridge that gap. All right, Jada. Yeah, I'll just make one comment regarding the, the down payment. Um, very, very true. I think for us, our families could come up with $1,500 maximum. That's it. Um, any, like they can maybe get that at a part of it as a gift from other family members or maybe from the other people that were in the household, but that's it. But like, so how we end up thinking about that um, when we were developing the product was, was like, of course, from a risk perspective, but I think the, for us to determine the risk was how painful is it for that family to come up with that money? And that's kind of how we thought about the amount of down payment that, would, that we would need to require from, from the actual family. And then we did go to the city of South Bend and was able to get a little bit more to um, supplement the down payment. But our main question was, is this a painful amount for, for the family to give us um, and to invest in their first home? Yeah, it, it feels like all of you in some way have spoken to the importance um, of cash in this equation and the challenge for so many families in coming up with the cash for say the down payment in order to get that small dollar loan. By contrast, of course, there are all of these people who are coming in with all cash offers. And part of what exacerbates this problem is that sellers have cash buyers at their door. And so it's easy for them. And the incentives are oftentimes aligned for them to just simply sell to the people who have that cash. Um, Ben, maybe we can start with you. Can you comment on how you see this cash buyer phenomenon playing out um, and maybe what folks might be able to do to help push back against some of how this exacerbates challenges for people trying to get small dollar loans? Sure. I, I mean, I think it's important to note that uh, there are cash buyers across the entire housing market. Um, I was looking at some data from a few months ago that we had in a story that um, something like a quarter of home buyers in April uh, bought homes with all cash. And um, beyond that, more than half put uh, over 20% down on their homes. So even, even without cash, you still have people putting down huge down payments. Um, 
that said, I think in the in this sort of small dollar um, housing market, you it you have sort of this exacerbated this this, this exacerbated issue of what you experience more broadly, and um, when the home prices are low, you have it makes it easy for someone like an investor to come in and purchase a home with cash, uh, even if it's out of reach for um, sort of a lower income person that wants to buy the house. Um, and so going back to the example of Detroit, I mean, one of the things that we found is that a lot of the homes that can be purchased for 20, 30, $40,000 um, end up getting purchased by investors. Um, and there's sort of a long history of, of investors in Detroit uh, buying up homes and using more informal arrangements to um, rent them out or sell them to to uh, to potential buyers, but you um, it ends up being fairly uh, predominant in 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 that housing market. And um, I'm just thinking in particular of, of one example: a woman that we interviewed for a story. Um, she didn't go to get a mortgage. She went to one of these investors to get a house, and because she entered into a more informal arrangement, it was very unclear to her what was what she was purchasing, whether she was buying the house, the paperwork said, you're now the homeowner. Um, technically, uh, the company said it was a rent with an option to buy. Um, and uh, it ended up being a long legal struggle um, because she was sort of trapped in this informal arrangement. Um, uh, eventually, she did take ownership of the house. Um, so there was a happy story at the end. Um, but but it when you do have these cash buyers, you end up having a lot, a lot of investors um, who can really come into this market. And I think we've seen that a lot um, during the pandemic with, with the current housing market we have. Yeah, I appreciate that. Neil, you, you're, you work at a bank. And so in some ways, these cash buyers are in, in, in com competition with you in, in some respects. Maybe we'd just love to hear your comment on what impact they have on this small dollar mortgage challenge. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Malcolm. You know, we see this, you're exactly right, the competition, is, it's a day in and day out um, challenge. We, we, we hear reports daily that in, in, a, in a situation where they're putting in a, any type of borrower or, or consumers putting in a, an offer, you're getting a multiple cash, you're getting a multiple offer situation where they're, they're making uh, bids that are 5 10% more than asking price. And you get down to a situation where you get eight, several agents that have to say, we need a, a highest and best offer, and we need it within two hours. And what they end up doing is, is you either get a cash offer, and you take that offer, or you go with, with the, what you feel like are the best financing terms. One thing that, um, one thing that I, I did want to touch on as far as a challenge in the, in the small dollar mortgage piece is, is you touched in the graph, one of you touched in the graph in the presentation earlier, of the initial cost of, of originating a mortgage for, for all banks. And that's kind of a, it's a standardized cost. And if you look at that from that angle, that's why several lending institutions have put a, have put a, a minimum loan amount um, that they will offer. And we go back to working with first time home buyers and making sure that we educate our, our buyers of where the, where, the, where the lending opportunities are, what banks will, will not have a, a minimum. Our minimum is $10,000. There's not too many homes out there that $10,000 won't get, won't get that mortgage that they need. But there are several instances out there where the, the minimum is 50, 75, or $100,000. And, and that makes that very difficult. Another aspect of that is, is from an origination standpoint, a lot of your mortgage loan officers, especially on the secondary market, they're not on salaries, they're on commission based. So they have the same energy, the same time devoted on a $75,000 loan as they do a $750,000 loan. And they're, they're focused based on their, if they're on commission based, they're gonna focus on that, that larger dollar loan, which puts a lot of competition on that. Um, so I, I did wanna point that out as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for that comment, Neil. Um, again, audience members, please do submit your questions. We have some really great ones in the queue um, and we wanna get to them uh, in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I wanna ask a couple of more questions to our panelists specifically focused on solutions. So we've talked a lot about kind of what the problems are, how they manifest themselves and who they affect. But I wanna talk for a bit about 
how we can maybe find some solutions to this problem. And there's some really valuable local solutions focused on addressing these issues being implemented all across the country. Just two examples are the micro mortgage marketplace demonstration in Louisville uh, in, in Southern Indiana, and as well as Hurry Home in South Bend, Indiana. So Lena and Jada, I'm wondering if you two could briefly describe these potential solutions and any early lessons that you've learned. Lena, maybe we can start with you and then turn it over to Jada. Sure, Malcolm. Um, so the, let me first throw in some background. So in 2019, Urban Institute collaborated with two other institutions. One is FAHI, a CDFI, and the Homeownership Council of America, a technical assistance advisory form. So the three institutions formed a team in 2019 to launch a micro mortgage demonstration project in Louisville metropolitan area. And we specifically uh, targeted at three counties, Jefferson, Clark, and Floyd counties. And this demonstration project aimed at making small dollar loans more feasible and accessible. So this is uh, just a, a background. And what we did is in this project, we experimented with approaches mainly targeting at three dimensions. First, expanding the underwriting criteria. Second, reducing ancillary fees in the, original, uh, in the origination process. And the third is we try to leverage uh, more CDFIs and community banks to support mortgages. And more specifically, in terms of expanding underwriting criteria, what we did is we allow to account for rental payment history in an alternative to the traditional FICO credit score and uh, allow borrowing of up to 100% of the cost of the home. Uh, on the DTI side, uh, we allow DTI debt to income ratios of 45% with the ability to raise to 50% uh, with compensa uh, compensating factors such as sufficient cash reserves, vested retirement and rental payment history, as well as the down payment assistance allowing for a combined loan to value value ratio, the LTV of up to 105%. So we experimented with uh, expanding those underwriting criteria and see how the demand goes. And uh, on the fee side, uh, we reduce uh, ancillary fees in the origination process, such as full appraisals, title and origination fees. Um, in this demonstration project, uh, um, uh, we allow the usage of AVMs, which saves the borrowers up to uh, $500 in fees and shortens the overall origination timeline. So those are the approaches we took. Um, and we learned really important lessons throughout this entire uh, process. Uh, I'd like to highlight two today. So the first one is, um, by saying we provide greater accessibility and flexibility, there's always a cost here. Traditional mortgages that can be sold in the secondary market enjoy the low financing rates available in today's environment. And a loan, a loan originator um, must rely on alternative funding sources to be able to, uh, to offer a micro mortgage loan. Um, so at the, um, at the project onsite, FAHI, the CDFI, um, was able to tap a capital source that relied on funds originating from a bond program. However, uh, this source established our interest rate on the micro mortgage at 4.5% back then, which is higher than the market rate last year amid the pandemic where the market experienced the historically low interest rate environment. So although homeowners with non-traditional credit often face higher interest rate through alternative lending sources, um, a rate that is perceived to be higher than the market has limited product adoption among potential home, home buyers, as well as real estate agents who can be reluctant to market the program. So this means, this lesson means that CDFIs need to secure more lower cost of funding to pass on a more competitive interest rate to potential home buyers, which is very challenging right now. And the second lesson we learned is the need for renovation financing. So often when we say low cost homes, uh, we say they are affordable, uh, but in fact, they tend to be old and in need of repair or upfront costs. However, small dollar mortgage credit is very scarce for rehabs or renovation projects in older homes, which means it is harder for LMI home buyers to maintain home ownership, even if they can get approval for the purchase loan. So this means additional support is definitely needed to couple renovation financing with purchase and address and also address the appraisal gap issues in low cost market areas. 
Um, so I will stop there and turn it over to Jada. Awesome. Wow, that was that was amazing. Um, so our we have some similar learnings as well with our program. So our program is definitely not a mortgage. Um, so it was a uh, rent with a purchase option. And again, we kind of we looked for non-traditional funding sources because we weren't sure that you know we would be able to to tap in to to large amounts of traditional funding sources. And we took one insight. So it was we realized. Yes, a lot of these, these investors in these markets are cash investors, um, but they weren't institutional investors. So they were these small kind of mom and pop investors because they, they love these assets because of the high yield um, of, of these assets or potential high yield of this, at these assets. But um, the big kind of single family investors that we saw like really rush to single family investing post, post the financial crisis, um, they were staying out of this part of the market, this, this part of the asset class because of the volatility or the perceived volatility of, of the asset. Um, so what we thought is the potentially huge pot of money that we could go after as, as this investment class is um, for this investment, this, this asset would be these single family investors. If we can make this product less, less volatile. And, and we thought by making this product less volatile um, and still giving you know, pretty good yield, um, we would just have to validate that by putting people that wanted to own these houses and that had the intention to own these houses, um, we could decrease the cost basis of property management. Um, and uh, so, so, I mean, a few things worked, a few things absolutely did not work. Um, I think the hardest part for us was finding the right type of capital and, or mix of capital to support this, to support the um, affordability of this product. Um, and I think we got close with our initial product, but ideally we would have had a, just a, a capital stack that had maybe a CDFI, a loan from a CDFI, a mission aligned equity from a foundation. So like MRI, PRI, and then um, some, a small amount of, of, of capital from like kind of like vanilla equity investors um, where, and then potentially maybe like a, a PMI type insurance that was backed by, by the city or something like that. So that would help to, to maintain one. I think it's really cool to have all these parties that are invested in the future of this neighborhood working together um, but also it would help help with the um, to drive the yield down that's required by the um, really just really to drive the yield down because now the perceived risk of this product would be would be less would be much lower. Um, and then another point would be credit credit was always a, was always an issue for the residents. Um, it was really tough to qualify in the beginning, especially because we were looking at tons of different types of documents to to make sure to to qualify families. Um, so I can see, like we talked to a bunch of community banks that were doing work um, to provide this, um, just just like. Um, just like Neil here, and they, what they were doing is they always said that qualification was just really the, the longest part of the process. So because, because that was a bottleneck, they just couldn't even really provide the amount of, of loans that they wanted to provide. So I don't know if, if maybe a potential solution would be, you know, other CRA requirements that would help support some of the, the manpower behind, behind the, the qualification needed for these first time home buyers. Um, or even maybe um, looking to some technology that can help with with OCR and reading the documents and streamlining, or even like Plat, which which we started using in connecting the family's bank accounts and quickly identifying what would be the the you know the rent, the utilities, and everything coming in on a month to month basis. Um, and then another piece would be the, so there was a large amount of houses that were ready, move-in ready, but there also were definitely houses that were maybe a little bit under that, where they may have needed the maybe $2,000 to $5,000 within the next year or two years to be invested. Maybe that's on a sump pump, maybe that's on... Um, I mean, there's there's so many little maybe that's on new windows, that's an insulation, like little things like this that may not have been with considered in the to be I mean a part of the family's budget, um, and how we got around this was in that initial qualification we included a forced savings of, of fifty dollars per month that was reserved for the family to only use on on maintenance and repairs that would come up, and I think that maybe something like that could be could be considered in, in a more traditional product that would um, ensure the longevity of of the actual housing um, and and the the um, I guess affordability or liquidity um, to to pay for those those um, fixes as they came up. 
I think that covers most of my learnings, but thanks for, ha thanks for having me guys. Thank you, Jada. Uh, and we would just want to do, I want to do one more question before we take um, Q&A from the audience. Um, maybe we can just go around and have each person answer quickly because we do want to get to those audience questions. If there's one thing that you could change right now to improve outcomes for people looking to get small dollar mortgages, what would that thing be? So we're going to just do a round robin. Um, we'll start with Neil, then we can do Jada, Ben, and then Lena. Um, very, very quickly, what's one thing that you would change if you could wave a magic wand and do so immediately? Neil, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Matt. There's one thing I could change, it would be to make sure that we can provide the, the financial education uh, to every every buyer, every homeowner, every first-time home buyer that's looking for a, for a home, for a mortgage, to provide the resources to them because I don't feel like we're able to get fully get the resources out as we should. Um, no, matter ever how, no matter how much resources for financially, and how much time that we volunteer to get this out, I never feel like we fully get there. And that's the one thing I would do. Jada, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I mean, the lowest hanging fruit for me is probably to support the, the institutions that are, that are actually making these. Um, there, from my research, a few people, few institutions were saying that they were doing these. Um, but they're, they're actually not. So I definitely kind of would like to shame them. But then the, there's the ones that are doing these. And, and I would like to give them the resources, provide them the resources that they need, technology, whatever it is, to help them uh, bolster their efforts. I think I'm next here. I, uh, uh, I'm not sure I have one answer in particular, but um, when I think about all of the, so this issue, so much of it goes back to kind of a historical legacy of um, of exclusion, and it's not just necessarily small dollar mortgages. But I know Jada was talking about how some of the some of the home buyers are not necessarily prepared credit wise to uh, to become homeowners, and I think a lot of that goes back to the fact that a lot of these same neighborhoods that don't have access to credit are also underbanked, and so you have um, some of some of these sort of larger historical issues that that need to be fixed is kind of like a, a baseline in order to be able to to make small dollar mortgages um if i have to say one thing then i guess it's after hearing our conversation today is uh to incentivize more warriors into this battleship um uh, i guess it's just we need to realize it's a really complicated issue that needs a holistic approach with collective actions. And this involves local nonprofits, housing developers, counselors, real estate professionals, lenders, and maybe even local employers who can help potential home buyers understand the opportunity they have and how to access those resources to make it happen. Um, so yeah, I would just say raise the awareness, try to uh, make it happen and, and have a collective action. Wonderful. Thank you all for your insights. Um, really, really valuable. We are not done yet because we do have a number of audience questions that we want to get to. And of course, um, these questions are open to all of our panelists. But I would also say to our earlier presenters, um, if you feel like there is something that you'd like to add to any of these questions, feel free to hop off mute because we'd love to hear from you as well. So I'm going to start with the first question. And this is for anyone who would like to answer. Uh, this comes from the audience. Is there a higher risk of predatory lending in the case of low cost housing mortgages being unavailable? Anyone have any thoughts there? I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that. I'm not sure I have any numbers per se to back it up, but just in interviews with home buyers who can't get access to, to small dollar mortgages, we have, I have found that they are they tend to be more likely to turn towards these alternatives and um uh i'm not sure there's one necessarily one answer about whether the alternative is predatory or not there's some there's some very good options and there's some very bad options but um i have found that uh, uh, and there are a number of specific cases where people do end up in these very complex situations and might lose the, the home as a result if they use an alternative um, type of financing, like, like a contract for deed or such. Um, from my research, I did hear, um, a particular in, particularly in Chicago, 
um, back before the Fair Housing Act. Um, I think it was over maybe, I can't remember the exact span of years, so I won't, I won't say it, but um, Ta-Nehisi Coates also covers it in, in a bunch of his Atlantic um, articles. And um, there's some definitely some housing uh, warriors in, in Chicago that, that'll definitely speak at length about it. And they it was said to be about $4 billion was stolen from the African-American community that had um, chosen to, to engage in land contracts because of the, 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 the um, the con I mean, the consequences of, of redlining. Um, so I think that alone in, in one community, right, in, in Chicago, um, who, who's to say kind of how, how um, other citizens fared across the, the nation. Wow, that number is massive, um, but I suspect uh, it shouldn't be too surprising considering the scale of, of, the, of this issue that we've talked about. Um, Maybe um, we can do a little bit more of a, of a research focused question um, for the folks who, who spoke earlier. Um, how are you measuring the quality of homes in Forsyth County? Does this come from local tax assessor records somewhere else? Uh, a person from the audience asks that question. I'll take that one. So that is data that's actually publicly available. Um, you can get it from some of these larger data companies that scrape um, you know, tax data and stuff like that, but it does come from um, local sources that um, log that information and log that as tax assessment data. But, but you, can, you can acquire that through many different means. Wonderful, thank you for that, Zach. So the next question is a little bit of an open question um, to kind of anyone who'd be interested in answering. Um, someone just says they would love your opinions on how to balance the need for small dollar loans with the need for habitable homes. Any thoughts? I'll jump, I'll jump, I'll take this one, Malcolm. This is, um, this is kind of a new, newly developing project that we are, are working with currently. Um, and what we're doing are taking homes that are in a high need of repair and working with some local nonprofits to provide the financing to purchase these homes and renovate them. Um, and then also work with, with local financial literacy programs to get these, um, to get these homes purchased by, by low to moderate income uh, borrowers. So we are just starting this project actually in our first, uh, first property now. So I would love to keep you guys um, aware of how this goes, but we're just starting this. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so maybe um, we can turn back to some of the research we heard about earlier. So Sabiha and Zach, this one's probably for you. Um, did you analyze the current ownership of available affordable homes in the context of your research? I can take that if Sabiha doesn't want to. Um, so we, we didn't dive too deeply into that, I think that's that's probably going to be an, an area for a deeper dive for maybe some follow-up research. Um, I mean, we looked into what percentage of those affordable home stock is owned by um, investors using our the particular data source that we had. Um, it wasn't as large of a percentage as perhaps I was expecting at the outset. I, I don't have that number on hand, um, but that's definitely an area we'd like to do more follow-up research on. That's a great question. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, we looked at, you know, ownership kind of, we use sort of cash as a proxy for ownership of buyers, not of existing, um, existing affordable housing stock. Um, but another uh, sort of area for deeper dive is the presence of institutional investors, which I know that Jada mentioned. Um, and looking at the, you know, there's obviously a lot of, um, a lot of interest in this topic um, with Wall Street and hedge, um, hedge funds, um, interest in real estate investments recently. And so we um, have looked a little bit and did a lot of qualitative research on the presence of institutional investors and really trying to tease out um, who is a large investor uh, versus sort of those more small mom and pop investors. Um, and some, from some of my research, I've um, by you know comparing where where um, small 
mom and pop investors are versus the institutional guys. It seems that um, of the investment properties in this range or in the, the full realm of, of single family investment, about 90% um, of them under the 200,000 value um, would be small mom and pop. So owning less than 10 properties um, versus um, anything above the I can't exactly remember the threshold, but I want to say it's probably a 350 or maybe like three, 300 plus. It would be um, uh, like, again, like crazy, like maybe 70% owned by, by the, 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 the single, the institutional guys um, that really gobbled those up since the financial crisis um, when they kind of went on a, a huge spree. Jada, while I have you, just a quick question for you um, from an audience member. Uh, out of curiosity, how many home buyers has Hurry Home helped, and how large is the current lending portfolio? Yeah, pretty pretty small. So we've only helped about fifteen families, of which um, now we have maybe three of them that are homeowners of their house. Um, I think we've we had some really cool cases where you know some of them were in self employed, um, and they had been living in their house for nine years plus, and we came in and, and helped them purchase the house. And in, in three years, they, they finished purchasing it all. Um, so really you can tell like, these are, these are high quality borrowers. Um, and then uh, we've had one woman actually recently, she wanted to leave her house. So we sold it and she walked away with $15,000, um, which is just, it's, it's like money she would, she would never see otherwise. Um, and so yeah, I think the limitations for us is, is the capital, like finding capital that is mission aligned enough that's not going to push us to be too unaffordable for, for the home buyers. Um, because finding that, that balance between yield um, and, and affordability, honestly, has been, been really, really tough. Wonderful. It's really great to hear about the impact of your work. And, and those examples, I think, are, are exactly why we're, we're so pleased to see you um, working in this space. Um, we just have about five minutes left, so I'm going to pose one more question to all of our speakers today, and anyone who feels so inclined should feel free to jump in. Um, this question, again, from the audience is, in what ways are lenders actively deconstructing discriminatory practices that have been created in large part the challenges of these small dollar homes? Um, anyone have any thoughts um, about what lenders are doing to push back against these challenges, particularly the discriminatory um, components that have exacerbated a lot of these challenges? The floor is open. I'll jump in there, Malcolm. Um, you know, one, one thing, there are several lenders are going away from the commission-based um, compensation of mortgage loan officers going to salary-based. Um, I will tell you that's a, that's the way our entire model is, is salary-based um, to make sure that, that we're able to help everyone that needs help um, and we're not, not putting any type of favoritism. Um, another thing is, as we talked earlier, continue to look for down payment assistance. Um, that that's, it continues to be key. Um, Jada touched on uh, one issue that we didn't touch a lot on is the appraisal issue. And looking for and looking for um, several different avenues between the local um, counties and municipalities to, to one look for down payment assistance, but also look for funding to bridge that gap between purchase prices and, and the appraisals. Um, and we're starting uh, to see a little bit of success with that, um, but we've got to continue looking for that and continuing to to, to not take no for an answer. So, a couple, a few ideas. Thanks. Thanks for that, Neil. And I'll just echo what you said. Um, and this comes in large part from my perspective, working at Better, where we, like you said, have um, made sure that our loan officers are not working on commission. So there's more alignment between the incentives of the customer and the incentives of the loan officers. I love that folks have talked about down payment assistance over the course of our time together. Um, I think that is a, a very underutilized space. And we've spent a lot of time I'm talking to lawmakers and regulators about the importance of continuing to um, emphasize and, and market these down payment assistance programs to folks. And I'm also really pleased that you talked about appraisals. At Better, we have um, a really wonderful uh, appraisal expert, a woman named Jillian White, who's done a, a great deal of extensive research over the last many months and years about how we can make 
what has historically been um, a very homogenous industry that hasn't taken into account a whole lot of input from outsiders. How can we make that industry a little bit more thoughtful about some of those discriminatory practices that you all have mentioned? So um, I think those are really great examples, but speaking uh, as someone who has a foot in the industry, I think our industry has a lot more to do. And so I'm appreciative of that question. And my hope is that um, the next time we have a convening like this, there will be a lot more inputs from industry players about the work that we can do to push back against some of those discriminatory practices. Um, so with that, I just wanna say thank you to all of our panelists and speakers. You all have been really, really fantastic and your insights have been just exceedingly valuable and I know will uh, help continue to enliven the research and the conversation around this topic. Um, before we leave, I'm gonna pass it back to my colleague, Yulia, who's gonna close us out today. Thank you all so much. Great, thank you, Malcolm. And thank you to all of the panelists and presenters for a really rich discussion. I have a feeling that uh, this will not be the last we hear of this uh, topic. There's clearly so much more that needs to be done. Uh, but for now, I would like to thank all of you uh, to the audience. Uh, uh, please take a look at the report that came out today and it should be the link to it should be on the bottom right of your screen and uh, wishing everybody a lovely rest of your afternoon. <laughs>